Today I'm going to be showing you how to draw the stress strain diagram from the Leaving Cert higher level exam paper. This is typically question 2 part B and is a guaranteed question every year. Now you can see from the question shown here there are two elements to this. You have a graph which is made up in this case of stress which is measured in newtons per millimeter squared and strain which is just a straightforward number and the strain is based on the extension or how much the sample is stretched by compared to the original length of the sample. There are three parts to this question um, from 2020. The first one is to actually just draw the diagram, which is one of the more straightforward parts of this question. Then you have the proof stress, which I will explain when we get to that section. And finally, Young's modulus, which I will explain when we get to that section. Now to start off with, when you are actually drawing this diagram, there are two axes. You have your x-axis, which is your horizontal axis. And in this case, that is usually the strain or extension. Then you have your y-axis, which is your stress or your load. And in this case, it's going to be our stress. So we're going to start off, we have our extension down here. And in this case, when you have um, your extension, or in this case, our strain, the strain has no units and the extension is typically measured in millimeters. Up along the x-axis, we have our stress, which is measured in newtons per millimeter squared. Now, depending on the material and depending on the graph, this may end up being kilonewtons per millimeter squared, but that has no effect on the way this question is actually answered. Sometimes, however, you will see a load extension diagram and the load is always measured in newtons or kilonewtons. Now, I typically draw this diagram in landscape format where the extension goes along the uh, y-axis, the long edge of the paper, and the stress goes up the short end of the paper. So I'm going to start at this point here and I'm going to draw my two axes. So there's my stress axis and there is my strain axis. Now, the units here are very important. Now, you'll notice from the graph when we looked at it that we go up as far as 8.5. So, if I look at this here, if I assume that this is starting at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, it's ready made. to go up in whole units like that. And this is typically why I put the strain on the long axis, because it lets me spread it out a bit more. Now for the stress, we're going up as far as 352. So we have a couple of different options we can do this. And it's usually a good idea to plan this beforehand. So I'm going to look at here, 50, 100, 50, 200, 50, 300, 350. Now I need 352, so that's not going to work for me. So in this case, I might go 75, 150, or I might just go straight forward as in 100, 200, 300, 400. There is no right answer as such because the information you're going to get from the graph is going to be roughly the same no matter which way you do it. So you could go 75, 150, uh, what's that, 225, 300, 375, for example. But we'll keep it simple. We'll go 100, 200, 300, 400. We'll leave it like that. Now, you start plotting your points. So our first point is stress of 50 and strain is 0.6. So there's my 50, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. There's my stress, 0 0.6. Then it's 125 and 1.4. So that is 110, 25, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 195 and 2.2, so 195 and 2.2, so 2.1, 2.2, and that's 200, 190, so 195 is in the middle there. Now you'll start to notice these lines are all pretty much going in a straight line, and that's what you would expect to see in this first part of the graph, where this section here is your elastic portion. So we'll continue on this. Now, 
Now you see in here it's starting to flatten out now at this point. Now you can draw this curve freehand, but the most important thing here is to draw it as a smooth curve as possible. And there's your finished graph. Now you have your break point here, your fracture point here. This is where your sample is going to break. Now if you look, it's relatively straightforward. Your ultimate tensile strength is the maximum strength before it breaks. So in this case, it's going to be 352. Um, there's nothing else you need to do at this point. That is the first part of this question done. Now, the problem we have here is we have an elastic portion of the graph, which is roughly down around here somewhere. You have your plastic portion of the graph, which is roughly up here somewhere. With some graphs, it's very easy to tell where that point is. This is not that straightforward. So what they developed is they developed what's known as proof stress. What they've came up with was at 0.1% proof stress, and by the way, this is strain multiplied by 1000. At 0.1% proof stress, you draw a line, and in this case, you draw a line from one. So our 0.1% proof stress, if it's multiplied by 1000, gives us one. And you draw a line from the one that is parallel to the straight line portion of the graph. So you get your ruler here, and I slide it down, keeping it parallel, and I draw a line up from one. This point here, where it intersects with the graph, you draw a horizontal line across. And when you draw your horizontal line across, what you get, and that's a little bit crooked, apologies, that should go to there, is you get a stress here, and this is at 310, 20, 30. So our proof stress is 320 newtons per millimeter squared. Now, what this basically means is this is the point on the graph where you transition from your plastic deformation to your, um, uh, sorry, from my apologies, from your elastic deformation to your plastic deformation. Once you don't go past that point in a real world environment, when you remove your stress, the material will always return back to its original length. Once you go past that point, plastic deformation occurs, which is permanent deformation of your sample. Now, that's relatively straightforward. That is the first two parts of the question done. The last part of this question is Young's modulus. And Young's modulus is simply defined as stress, which is measured in newtons per millimeter squared over strain. Now, the most important thing to note at this point is the word calculate. You are asked to calculate Young's modulus. If you just write down the answer and the answer is incorrect, you're going to get zero marks for that question. If you go through the stages and you make a mistake somewhere and the number ends up being wrong, you will still get some marks because you have shown that you understand what Young's modulus is. You just, for some reason, didn't get the correct um, breakdown of numbers. So, in this case, Young's modulus is taken from anywhere on the elastic portion of the graph. Now, as you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, maybe four points. You can see here it's starting to deviate from the straight line part here. So I would normally go for one of the earlier points, so either point one, point two, or point three. So I'm looking at the numbers here and point two seems to be the most straightforward. So at point two, my stress is 125. My strain, I am told, is 1.4. 
Now, 125 divided by 1.4, and I should have had this worked out previously, so I'm just going to get my calculator now. This gives us a value of 89.28. Now, you can't just leave it at that point. You actually have to go back up here and what are the units? Young's modulus is not just a number, it's actually a measurement of, in this case, stress. So in this case, it is 89 newtons per millimeter squared. That is what Young's modulus is. And in a real world scenario, what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep the load in and around this value here, which keeps us in and around 89.90 uh, newtons per millimeter squared, which means you will never ever go past the failure point here where you're switching from elastic deformation to plastic deformation. And that is how you answer the graph portion of this question for your uh, leave insert. Hope you find this useful.